Okay, we're going to get started. If you could uh, sit down, please. Hopefully this will be as entertaining as my session yesterday. <laughs> Sergei Magnitsky was a Russian tax accountant for the Moscow law firm of Firestone Duncan, who was arrested in 2008 and died after 11 months in police custody. Since then, American-born British investor Bill Browder, who was a client of Firestone Duncan's, has gone on a high-profile campaign alleging that Magnitsky was a whistleblower who was beaten to death by Russian police. Browder claims that Magnitsky discovered that Russian police and others had raided the offices of Firestone Duncan stolen seals belonging to Browder's companies and then used those seals to perpetrate a $230 million tax refund fraud. Browder claims that Magnitsky was a whistleblower who filed a criminal complaint and that Russia is so corrupt that he was arrested for being a whistleblower and ultimately killed to shut him up. Browder has written a book about the case and persuaded politicians in the USA to pass the Magnitsky Act, sanctioning 18 allegedly corrupt Russian individuals whom he claims were involved in the tax fraud and death of Magnitsky, directly or indirectly. Other countries have passed Magnitsky-inspired legislation. Russia retaliated by banning the US adoption of Russian children and banning 18 Americans from entering Russia over alleged human rights violations. Over the last few years, an alternative narrative has been put forward by journalists and others that Browder is a serial tax cheat, that Magnitsky was not a whistleblower, but had helped Browder commit tax offenses, that he died of natural causes, not beaten to death, and that Browder's campaign is full of lies and is self-serving, including seeking to portray Browder as a victim so he will not be extradited to Russia. If true, and it's a big if, huge if, if you like, it would constitute possibly the most audacious scheme that I've personally come across. The purpose of this session is to determine, or try to, because it's somewhat gray, fact versus fiction concerning this extremely high profile matter and try to sort of sensibly interpret, it, interpret the information that's available, because it really isn't black uh, or white, in, in some areas anyway. So with me, I have Sergei Magnitsky's former boss, Jameson Firestone, uh, who is adamant that the generally accepted narrative is materially accurate, and New York-based journalist Lucy Commissar, uh, who is adamant that it isn't. And the, the way we're going to do this session is sort of a debate style. It's broken down into five segments. Both Lucy and Jameson will have uh, six minutes each to speak. Um, and, and, uh, so, and then we'll ask uh, questions uh, at the end. So Lucy is going to talk first. And the first of the five topics is who blew the whistle on the tax fraud first, which is quite key. Was it Sergei Magnitsky? a lady called Rima Starova, or someone else. And this sort of goes to sort of the heart of this whole thing. You know, was he or wasn't he a whistleblower? So Lucy, if you could take us away for approximately six minutes. Uh, Rima uh, Starova uh, blew the whistle on the tax, uh, uh, 
Rima Starova blew the whistle on the tax fraud. She was the figurehead director of one of the re-registered shell companies used in the fraud, which involved fake collusive lawsuits. You cheated on our contract. You owe X rubles. Okay, I will pay. And that zeroed out the, the paying company's profits so they could demand and get a full refund of taxes paid, which was 230 million. When she read in the papers in April 2008, that authorities were investigating the re-registration of the company, she was apparently concerned she might be implicated and went to the police to give testimony to put herself in the clear. She said there had been falsified certificates of debt in the amount of 13 and a half million rubles. That would be equivalent to the company's profits. She would make another statement July 10th that the company seemed to have stolen 5.4 billion rubles from the state, uh, the am amount that they paid in taxes. Uh, Browder knew she had gone to the police. In a press release Hermitage put out in September 2008, it said, uh, April 08, Ms. Staro Starova uh, files a criminal complaint with the Russian Interior Ministry in Kazan, falsely accusing representatives of HSBC companies of the theft of state funds. Actually, she didn't mention HSBC. Uh, she said that Browder's Cypress shells, Cone and Glendora, were behind the fake lawsuits. The press release disappeared from the Hermitage site for obvious reasons, because she was the whistleblower, but exists on the Wayback Machine, and that's the, the slide that you saw. Paul Wrench is a professional figurehead director in Guernsey, fronting many different offshore firms, including those that were controlled by Browder. Two weeks after Starova's second police visit, Wrench, July 24th, 08, filed a complaint about the tax refund fraud, claiming 230 million was stolen with the help of police. Browder gave the story to the New York Times and Vedemusti that day. On August 15th, Browder wrote Russian finance minister Kudrin about the theft of companies used in the treasury tax refund fraud. So what did Magnitsky say and when? Magnitsky's only testimonies before his 2008 arrest were in Oct uh, November arrest were in October 06 and June and October 08. The first was before the tax refund fraud, the latter two after Rima Starova had gone to the police. Magnitsky had been summoned to answer questions by investigators into Browder's tax evasion. He wasn't coming forward to reveal a crime. Browder and his team anointed Magnitsky as a whistleblower only after he died. In a video they created, Hermitage Reveals Russian Police Fraud, uploaded on YouTube October 8th, 09, a month before his death, Magnitsky had been in Russian jail for over 10 months. Browder's hero was largely ignored. He mentioned Magnitsky briefly, calling him a consultant, but nothing about this alleged investigation. Uh, then uh, tying, but there were lying links uh, about Magnitsky's testimonies. If you look on his website, he invented him as a whistleblower. Uh, Browder would tell the Congress, the press, and the world Magnitsky was arrested for fingering the Russian police. So this website has links to what are claimed to be Magnitsky's testimony. One says Magnitsky names Lieutenant Colonel Kuznetsov and Major Karpov and their role in the thefts. That's the June testimony, 08. Magnitsky describes the role of the Interior Ministry offices in the thefts. That's his October 08 testimony. The texts, uh, the texts on the links are lies. You click through to the document in Russian, Browder didn't uh, post the fake English translations. The true translations exist on PACER, public access to court electronic records, the database of the US federal court system. They show that in Magnitsky's only testimonies before his arrest, there is no mention of police officers being connected to a fraud. He does not even mention the fraud until October 08, not in June, at an interrogation to which he was summoned as a suspect in Browder's tax evasion, for which he was arrested the next month. Then he tells of a fraud of budget monetary assets in the amount exceeding five billion rubles. He makes no accusations. That was six months after Starova's first April 08 testimony, three months after her second July 10th testimony, three months after publication in Vedamusti and the New York Times. Later in November, 2015, Paul Wrench was asked in a sworn deposition in the Prevazon case, uh, SDNY, uh, with whom had he discussed the complaint about the tax refund fraud uh, that he filed in July 08? Question, did you discuss this document with anyone at the time you signed it? 
At the time I signed it, I would have discussed this document before signing it. With whom? Wrench, with uh, Ivan Cherkasov, that's Browder's partner. Anyone else that you can recall? Not that I recall. So six years after Magnitsky's death, with Browder shouting to the world, Magnitsky was a whistleblower, Wrench, under oath, avoiding perjury, does not back Browder up. Browder's claim that Magnitsky was a whistleblower is a flagrant and unsupported lie. Very good, almost, uh, well, five and a half minutes, you went under. I gotta stand over there um, and try not to fall off this stage because uh, my slides are kind of my note here, my notes here. So I'm gonna actually show you what was reported by whom and then I'm gonna give you a little, treat you to a little surprise here. Okay, but let's review the crime for a second. On June 4th of 2007, the, the police raid my offices and they take a few things. They take corporate seals, they take original corporate registration documents, financial information, and they put these materials into the custody of Major Pavel Karpov. Now, while the documents and seals are with uh, Mr. Karpov, something strange happens. Our companies are sued for $973 million and a lawyer we've never heard of shows up and says, we're guilty, judge, we owe the money. So $973 million worth of judgments against our companies. How could this happen? Well, it so happens that when the materials uh, were with the police, the shareholders of the Hermitage companies were changed, and a new shareholder was put in, a company called Pluton, headed by a convicted killer, who made himself director of the three Hermitage companies, and then appointed those lawyers who arranged those debts. Now, central to our allegations are that Russian police were involved in this fraud that materials and information taken from us by the police were used to hijack control of the Hermitage companies and were used in court to commit the fraud. And therefore, the police must have given these materials to the criminals. Uh, the Russian government narrative and Lucy's narrative is the police are innocent and we arranged the fraud ourselves. So let me, how, how can we prove that the police gave the uh, materials to the criminals for the fraud? Well, first of all, it's impossible to re-register, change the ownerships of Russian companies without the original corporate documents and they were in police custody with Major Karpov. Second of all, lawyer Pavlov, that guy who showed up in court, his computer, and created the fake debts, his computers were hacked when he was fighting a Kazakh oligarch, and the guy posted his entire computer online. And so you can see his WhatsApp desktop messages texting the police saying, we need, a, we need a backdated police report showing that the seals that you are holding in your custody weren't used in the crime. Also, three years later, the Russian, years later, the Russians released this detailed inventory of what they took from my office. Very, very detailed documents that happened to just be used in court later on. So the Russians said the police had them, and then they're used in court. And also, by the way, our Officer Karpov vacations with Pavlov and his wife. We got a hold of his visa application coming to the UK, right? And it says he's coming on vacation with lawyer Pavlov and his wife. Uh, now, we didn't know all this stuff when we filed our complaint, uh, our first complaint, but we certainly knew you couldn't register the companies and change the ownership without. So, Rima Starova, right? Yeah, okay. So, on um, December 3rd of 2007, we filed this, 244 pages of what happened in court and the criminal records of these people and the fake agreements, okay? And we filed this uh, complaint. And, you know, when she said Sergei didn't testify first, right, this Sergei prepared. So let's not play with words. This is Hermitage Capital filing on December 3rd of 2007. And this wasn't quiet. This was covered in the Financial Times back in April 3rd of 2008, and there are hundreds of articles. And this complaint can be downloaded from our website, and you could get it for years. Okay? Now, let me tell you what happened, okay? When those $973 million in judgments were created, uh, these criminals then used that to write off our profit. And then they refunded the $230 million in tax that we paid. And since they were in control of our companies at this point, they got that money. We didn't know about this, but when we found out about it, we filed another 200 and something pages, okay? Now, we filed this in December 3rd of 2007. It took them two months to open a criminal investigation, but here are the documents opening the criminal investigation, right? And, um... This, if you look at the dates, is four months before Starova filed anything. Four months before Rima Starova filed a piece of paper, we filed these 200 and something pages, okay? And not only that, the FT was reporting about our filing a week before Starova filed. So who is Starova and what was she doing? 
okay? Well, after the criminals got their refund, they needed to destroy these companies. They needed to destroy the evidence. So what they did was they sold them to a BVI company. And the BVI company put in Mr. Rova as the general manager of the Hermitage companies, right? And um, Sorova's good, you know, because it means old lady. That's what it actually means. And she's a 70-year-old old lady who comes 600, lives 600 miles from Moscow. And all of a sudden, she's managing director of, of what used to be Russia's largest hedge fund, okay? And what does Sorova do? This is particularly brilliant, okay? Four months after we complained and when there's already a criminal investigation, she files this. Help! My companies have fake debts against them, and I think it must have been the previous management, Hermitage. And what the criminals did was really, really sneaky, because they had Starova file this with their friends in the police, right? Who then said, hey, we've got an investigation, and they commandeered all the materials from the, from the original legitimate investigation. And now, and that's how they took over the investigation. And so now the criminals are investigating themselves, and all of everything we filed disappears. Now, here's what's kind of, and all of this was put in our press release that Lucy says has disappeared, right? And what it says in our press release is that Starova is a front for a criminal group trying to liquidate these companies um, and, and, and filed a fraudulent complaint against us. So I got a question. How does Lucy get this so wrong? How does she not see this filing, right? No, I'm going to end. No, I'm going to end. No, no. I'm going to answer you. Sorry. I'm going to answer you right now. Okay, I'm lying, you, you I don't think it. so. You can raise so it. what actually happens this. when we find out about this, okay? Well, we say, hell, we put together this uh, two filings in December of 2007. You can see them here, you can see the dates. I've got arrows pointing to the dates because you can see the dates, they can't. And when you watch Andre's movie, you're going to see he can't see the date, but I'm going to tell you why also. So the reason Lucy doesn't see these complaints, the reason that she told you that Starova filed first when she's aware of them, okay, is that the people spinning this narrative um, know it's untrue. And so the, the Russian government narrative, which is what Lucy spins, only works when you suppress documents. And I've got news for you. That's not investigative journalist. That's simply dishonesty. So, so, yeah, because the, nobody knew, wait. So, hold on. No, no, we're getting there. Hold on. I actually said that we filed about the tax refunds when we found out, and we're getting there. But the point is, okay, we filed first. We filed this. She didn't tell you about this because this destroys her narrative. And what you do is not investigative journalism, okay? I'm leaving this for you because it's heavy, and I don't want to take it back to London. Right, it was who, who blew the. Can you Q2? No, we're, no, I didn't. We're getting there. Uh, uh, so, so we need to keep strict. Yeah. Can I, I so just two, got right? one, one quick question. So, Rima Starova, so Starova literally means old lady in Russia. Yes. You, so, does she actually exist? Yes. Okay. I mean, I assume she exists. So, her name is like having uh, somebody in America called Mrs. Old Lady. Yeah, right. Okay, okay. I assume she exists. All right, so, so okay, so we need to keep somewhat on time here, otherwise yeah, so it's going to be chaos. I think we're going to go to the second thing, right? Yeah, yeah, so the second thing, so, so you can raise it at the end, Lucy, because the, the, the final um, segment is, you know, closing comments where you can rebut, if you like, anything you want. So the second topic is, uh, and Jameson's going to talk first because we're yeah. alternating. Um, uh, how did Sergei Magnitsky die? Was he beaten to death or not? Right, okay, so um, yes, he was. And, you know, when, when Lucy often says we don't have the documents to prove it, so I'm going to show you the documents now. And Lucy also says we kind of changed our story over time, which is true. You see, what happens is when you investigate things and you find documents and new information, you have to change your story to match the facts, which you should remember, okay? So let me show you what happened here. Um, Sergey is in prison, his health has been broken, he's in absolutely horrible conditions, too hot, too cold, bad food, and his health breaks, he loses 45 pounds. He develops uh, gallstones and pancreatitis, and the prison recognizes this and decides to get him an operation. But one week or so before the operation, uh, the chief investigator moves Sergei to a czarist era hellhole without any medical facilities um, on the grounds that they have to renovate his floor. His floor was never renovated, uh, not 
uh, and it was never scheduled for renovation. So he's in prison, he's writing that they're offering me my freedom if I change my testimony, but he doubles down and he testifies them again, again. And after four months of being kept in this basement cell, his health breaks. That's actually the document recording what happened. But what happened was he went into a fetal position, screaming in pain, and all the other prisoners started screaming, help, get this guy man some help. So they moved him for medical treatment right back to the facility that they had moved him from. And then he died. And we got this, the death certificate. Died of toxic shock. Diagnosis, acute pancreatitis. So, you know, we put together a picture, okay, this is what he was sick with. This is what he was supposed to be operated on. They didn't give him the operation. That's what he died of. That's what we thought at the time. But we saw this thing that said cerebral cranial injury question mark. It didn't fit, so we didn't pay too much attention. However, there were a lot of bruises and lacerations on Sergei's wrists. They couldn't uh, examine the body any further because the police refused to allow any independent examination. They posted a guard by the body and said, we will walk the, the casket to the ground and you will bury him in front of us. So his mother thought that was suspicious, filed criminal complaints saying we want an investigation to see if he was beaten. An NGO was, uh, was, was called to investigate and they concluded that he was detained in torturous conditions, denied medical care, and the state violated his right to life and all the officials they were talking to were afraid and lying to them. Uh, violating your right to life means I put you in a cell and then you're dependent on me to keep you alive. So if I turn off the heat or I don't feed you or I don't give you medical care, you die. But that's not all that was in there. Also what was in there was this report of the doctor, the prison doctor who was with him, that Sergei became agitated and it looked like acute psychosis and delirium of persecution. We called a psychiatric emergency. Uh, being asked, what does calling a psychiatric emergency mean? What did she, the doctor, do? She said that she called for enforcement, who came with eight people and they put handcuffs on Magnitsky's hands. This is from the prison doctor, okay, in the police files. The NGO also found out that there were civilian doctors who were there at 8 p.m. who were kept waiting one hour and 18 minutes, and when they were let in, they found Sergei dead in a, on a pool of urine with bruises from handcuffs and noted that he had died within uh, at least 15 minutes, i.e., they may have been waiting outside the cell while Sergei was dying. And these documents are in the police files and in the NGO. And by the way, this is what Mrs. Magnitsky got. These are the police file pictures of Sergei's hands and the bruises. And so we got a lot of traction on this at the time, and the president, uh, Medvedev, called the president's Human Rights Council, and they were called together to investigate what happened, and they hired experts, and they got the uh, Russian Forensic Examination Center of the Ministry of Healthcare and Social Development of the Russian Federation to look at all the police reports, and they determined that there were two different types of injuries on Sergei's body, one consistent with handcuff lacerations, and the other consistent with impact from a blunt hard object or objects, and here are the documents. Right, And then Mrs. Magnitsky gets this document. This is a photograph of the police folio. This is actually a police uh, record report on the day of Sergei's death by the people who were there, report on the use of handcuffs. And it says, confirming that a rubber truncheon was used on the suspect, Sergei Magnitsky, and that handcuffs were removed at 8 p.m. So you can't really draw a different picture from these documents. Uh, there's no other picture an honest person can, can do. Now, Lucy can say, we changed our story over time. We did. We got more information. And Lucy can say, hey, you know, the head of the presidential commission kind of recanted and changed the, the findings later on. And that's also true. He was head of the presidential commission under Medvedev. And then when he retained that job under Putin, while we were putting the Magnitsky sanctions all over the world, he kind of backtracked on some of his findings. But we already had the underlying documents, so we don't really care. So anyway, that's it. I want you to tell me how you can interpret these documents to mean anything else. Uh, okay, first, as I said before, this document that you showed has nothing to do with the tax refund fraud. The December uh, 07 document is only about the theft of the companies. Uh, HSBC, the uh, trustee, actually knew about it in July. They waited five months to report it. Nothing to do. They are not a whistleblower. He basically avoided the first question was, who's the whistleblower? Because he can't answer that. The second... Uh, uh, point we we get to the what how we are supposed to follow the the order So how did Magnitsky die? He died November 16th Browder says variously he died of illness. He was tied up and left to die He was tied up and beaten with rubber batons even tortured by prison guards. So let's let's look we, can I have the um, Device oh, okay. Thank you Right that was So, 
the, the Public Oversight Commission report was two months after the death. They are the only people that actually went in and did an investigation that talked to people on the ground, uh, the, the medical people, the prison people. And uh, it, it's a, a Moscow NGO that investigates prison conditions. Uh, its report was on the link to the Wall Street Journal. It's uh, on the, uh, uh, in, the, in the PACER reports. There is no claim of a beating made. The only time the word beating is used was his heart stopped beating. Then uh, Browder seems not to know how he died. He suddenly found new information. There was no new investigation. Uh, so this is the same month of uh, December 09, he tells the uh, Chatham House in London, I don't know what they were thinking, whether they killed him deliberately or if he died of neglect. Indeed, he died of neglect. A year later, he tells the San Diego Law School, they put him in a straitjacket, put him in an isolation room, waited an hour and 18 minutes till he died. Six months after that, uh, June 2011, the Physicians for Human Rights in Cambridge, to which he sent 44 documents, including the Public Oversight Commission report and photos, repeats Magnitsky died of illness made worse by medical neglect. No claim of a beating. But Browder had to uh, invent a, be a beating because the Russians are bearing down on him for his tax evasion. An advisor, Jonathan Weiner, a former State Department official, had gone to work for the international lobbying and PR firm APCO, which also represented Khodorkovsky. He came up with, with a brilliant idea. He's written that he came up with the idea, the Magnitsky Act to build a political wall against Russian law enforcement. The act based on punishing Russians deemed responsible for the death of Magnitsky. So Browder's first statements would not do. He had to to invent a killing. Now we get the, Cam the Cambridge speech, um, Cambridge Business School. They put him in an isolation cell, tied him to a bed, allowed eight guards to beat him with rubber batons for 18, 118, um, an hour and 18 minutes until he was dead. Uh, and he repeated that often. Note the variations. The Western media and the government uh, officials uh, probably don't. Look, look through various times. It starts at the top and goes down here as he changes his story uh, for, for obvious political reasons. Um, now, th it was mentioned this uh, closed, this, this is on his website, Browder's, uh, closed cerebral cranial injury. This is from the death certificate. Most of the other stuff is, you can hardly see it. It's very blurred, but that is uh, marked in red, and that's what it says. Well, take a look at the entire death certificate and look at the bottom. Closed, meaning it's a past injury, no signs of violent death detected. That is the death certificate, which was uh, represented here and certainly I don't recall that, that you denied that uh, was uh, not the case. Uh, to back up his murder story, Browder posted photos of bruises on Magnitsky's wrists and ankles. You've seen those. The first would be logically from the handcuffs, the second from kicking against the door or bars. There were no marks on other parts of the body, nothing on the face or head or torso. Mag Power Browder said Magnitsky was beaten by eight riot guards for over an hour, which means if you believe his story, the attackers were aiming for the victim's wrists and ankles alone. There were some marks on the knee. Taking turns one at a time, assaulting him all at once in that small room, he doesn't say. Or how Magnitsky was killed by blows to wrists and ankles, which don't really seem to be as serious as things like heart, brain. Uh, now, the handcuffs. Now, this is very interesting. This was referred to, the handcuffs document. Browder posts a document, allegedly, of a Russian report of baton applied to Magnitsky. It is a forgery. There was a document which he shows that handcuffs were used with the request made at 7.30. This fits with the Public Oversight Commission report, which said that at 7 o'clock, uh, that Magnitsky was acting very strange and uh, they, they really felt they need to protect him against self-harm. So that's why they put the, the handcuffs on. He was behaving erratically that he might harm himself. The report said the handcuffs were uh, removed after 30 minutes. This is sort of funny because if they were put on while uh, he was being beaten for an hour and 18 minutes, why would they put on handcuffs and take them off in the middle of this beating? Okay, the forgery. The report about the use of the baton is a fake. It's copying another form even to the headline about the handcuffs. It was a form about, there's one form about handcuffs. If the form about the baton was separate, the headline would be something about the baton. There's no place, as in the handcuffs version, to uh, explain the reason for the use. And there's no such form in the Russian prison system, which is why he could not find the form and, uh, and forge that with, uh, with Magnitsky's name. The signatures on the true document were traced onto the forgery. Uh, 
So here's the, the forgery uh, translated. The title is about handcuffs, inside text changed to cite rubber batons. Exactly the same as the other document, but batons. So here is how the, the forgery was made. A rubber baton replaces the words special means were in the handcuffs document. Um, then there's a funny thing in the, in the Browder book, the most bizarre invention. Uh, he writes that at 12.15 a.m. the night Magnitsky died, which is 3.15 Moscow time, he got a pleading voicemail on his Blackberry from someone being beaten. And he said, nobody has my phone number. The next day, Magnitsky was dead. He didn't say why he had forgotten to mention this in 2009 and 2010 in his statements, or how someone so abused had a cell phone in prison. They can't get them in the U.S. Or how the phone message arrived at 3.15 Moscow time, when the Public Oversight Commission said Magnitsky died at 9.30, which is something like maybe 18 hours later. So Browder posts a lot of accusing videos and documents. This audio is not there. I asked for it, and I got no response. By the way, dying at 4 in the morning also contradicts the time. In his own book, uh, several pages later, where um, he says, again, it's 9 or 9.40. Uh, now, it was mentioned the Kabanov uh, re uh, uh, rejection of this uh, Medvedev Human Rights Commission report. He gave a sworn oath uh, in U.S. federal court, uh, SDNY, uh, and he said, first of all, it was a working report, and they did no investigation. It was based only on Browder's documents, not anything by uh, the full uh, committee. So I have also have a question to uh, Jameson. Uh, you showed the pictures of the uh, ankles and, uh, and the wrists, and you said there wasn't an another. Well, actually, Jameson, there is another, because it was filed in the discovery process uh, of the Prevazon case, and the Browder team produced the document of the torso. Can you tell me if there were bruises shown on Magnitsky's torso? And could this be the reason, this, the, that document also went to Mrs. Magnitsky, could this be the reason that Mrs. Magnitsky in the Nekrasov film says she does not believe that uh, Magnitsky was beaten to death? Oh, oh, okay, so, so James, so could you maybe answer that in the final one? Oh, yeah. Otherwise, we're, we're going to get off track. So, so, so the, um, the third topic is uh, Bill Browder's criminal conviction in Russia. Legitimate or politically motivated? And um, Lucy's first on that. Oh, okay. Um, what were the charges? One was hiring the disabled. Uh, he was accused of teaching, uh, cheating on taxes owned, uh, owed by his shell companies, which held shares, and if they were sold, uh, he would have to pay taxes on the profits. In Kalmykia, uh, an, a region a few hours by plane from Moscow, they were trying to help the disabled. Many may have been from the Afghanistan war, but in general. If you had 50% of your employees disabled, you can get a big tax cut. It would go from 35% to 6.5% on profits, and there were other uh, tax advantages, cuts on VAT, property tax, turnover tax, cuts would equal 40%. And uh, companies that invested in the region would get another tax cut. The shells were Dalnaya Steppa and Saturn Invest. The investigation started in about 2003. Charges are brought in 04. Hermitage had filed it hired the disabled and invested in the region, but it didn't. It had no employees in those shell companies. The court established that three disabled workers were manual workers with other jobs, not entitled to be listed for tax relief. Browder had paid them to use their documents. On the question of, let's see. Investment. Uh, he, ad oh, he admitted about in his 2015 deposition that he used the scam. He was asked, who told him he could do that, the disabled scam? He said, Firestone Duncan, where Magnitsky worked, Arthur Anderson, Anderson which would very soon collapse after the Enron uh, debacle, and Deloitte and Tooch, where Magnitsky had worked before Firestone Duncan. So Browder admitted the scam under oath in U.S. federal court SDNY. There was no evidence of investment. Browder just moved assets from one shell to another. The court ruled the company did not carry out activities related to the production and sale of goods in the republic, for it had, it had no appropriate facilities. 
the CEO worked in the company part-time and resided outside the region, the claim was a fraud. The Russians found that from 1997, Firestone Duncan auditor Sergei Magnitsky had been the accountant for Hermitage and ran the illegal tax evasion schemes for Browder. In the case of Magnitsky, his mother, at Browder's behest and with Browder's lawyer, pursued legal action after his death to try to get her son rehabilitated. That gave prosecutors the chance to make legal arguments about Magnitsky's guilt in tax fraud, but only for the purpose of preventing his rehabilitation. You can try somebody who's dead only for the purpose of rehabilitation, as it's requested by the people on that person's side. In July uh, 2013, the Tversky District Court verdict was a conviction of Browder for tax fraud. With respect to Magnitsky, the judge agreed with the prosecutors he had abetted Browder's tax schemes and refused to rehabilitate him. A commerçant, the Russian financial newspaper, wrote, quote, the criminal prosecution of Mr. Magnitsky, who died in jail in 2009, was terminated by the court and his accomplice, that's Browder, was given a nine-year sentence. Why would Browder lie about Magnitsky being posthumously convicted? To suggest that his own conviction could not be just because why would the court convict a dead man? Except it didn't. Jameson. Okay, hold on. In Q&A, I can address some of the things that she said before this topic, but I actually want to talk about this particular topic. Um, so let me run you through this uh, trial of Bill Browder and, uh, and Sergey. You can't really uh, call Hermitage, um, you know, you can't accuse him of not paying taxes because we paid $407 million in taxes in 2006, which was more than Gazprom Bank or Aeroflot or all those other big companies. Um, so Bill was initially targeted when Hermitage took on a company called Sir Good Nefty Gas to prevent it from diluting minority shareholders. And uh, Putin and Timchenko were, were rumored to own shares in this company. And as soon as we tried to prevent that dilution, the Ministry of Internal Affairs launched investigations against basically every Hermitage company out there, including these two companies in Kalmyk. And when Bill didn't take the hint and he continued trying to stop the dilution, Bill's declared a threat to national security five days before our day in court. Meanwhile, these investigations uh, in Kalmykia continued on into 2005 and 2006. A lot of people were questioned, including Sergei, but they were all closed for lack of a crime. Um, now, the Russian government narrative, you know, kind of fails to mention that every investigation into Hermitage was fully investigated and closed by the end of 2006 with a finding of no crime. They want to make it look like Bill and Sergei were under investigation at the time that our offices were raided. Now, this is the decision closing the Dalnaya step case that Lucy just told you that Bill was, was, was convicted under, right? Closed. But the police needed a case to justify getting the materials from my office to commit the crime. And if the Kalmyk cases are any cases that existed against Hermitage, they would have simply used that as justification for the right raids, but there weren't any open cases. So they created a new case. They accused a company of, called Kamea of underpaying its taxes, even though the tax inspectorate confirmed nothing was owed, and that allowed Major Karpov to open the case and Lieutenant uh, Colonel Artem Kuznetsov to raid my offices. Now, if you remember, we filed a complaint uh, in December 3rd of 2007, pointing the finger at the police and saying, we think they're involved. They had to give the criminals, the lawyers, this all these documents. And uh, if you remember, uh, I actually did talk about this, but I'm going to talk about it again. We didn't know about the tax refund at that time. But when we found out about it, we reported it. But what I really want to show you here goes right to the heart of how Lucy and the Russian government narrative works. You see, in order to get the tax refund, they had to create fake debts that offset our profits, declared profits, 973 million. And by doing that, they got 230 million. So anybody with a calculator can take the number 230 million and divide by 973, and what you get is 24%. That's the rate of tax we paid. That's the highest rate of tax possible in Russia. Now, we did set up all these Kalmyk companies to save a whole bunch of money, but Putin canceled all of those tax, uh, all of those tax uh, what would you call them, uh, preferences, before we cashed out. So we didn't use them. So when you hear Lucy's narrative and she said we set up all these things to save taxes, we did. She just forgets to tell you that we didn't use them and we paid the highest rate of tax. Um, now, if you remember, we got a 
Criminal investigation opened two months after filing, after the money was stolen, but we still didn't know the money was stolen. We got this uh, case opened in February of 2007. On the basis of our complaint, Officer Karpov is questioned. And what do they do? Officer Karpov, along with two subordinates of the guy who raided my office, fly to Kalmykia, and they reopen the Dalnaya Step and Saturn investment cases, cases that they had zero prior involvement with. This is the ruling opening it. They don't just open the case. On the same day, without any further investigation, they change the findings from lack of a crime to crime, they indict Bill, and they move the case back to Moscow under their control. Okay? Meanwhile, Sergei does continue to testify, and here is his testimony, and he mentions them almost 30 times in his June testimony. And here's the application that Lucy says we're, we're hiding. This is actually page one of another 200 and something pages filed on July 23rd when we found out that the taxes were stolen. Okay? Long before Starova files her next emergency, oh my God, they've complained, we better complain again, complaint, right? And Sergei doubles down on his testimony in October 2008 and sticks by it. And then something really extraordinary happened. In late October of 2008, Sergei found that these criminals were in the business of making serial tax refunds. That one year before the police raids on my office, the same criminal group had gotten a $107 million refund with the same modus operandi. The same lawyer showed up in courts and threw the cases. The money was paid to the same bank. The contracts were the same word for word. And when Sergei broke this story, he had the officer's undivided attention. That's when uh, Officer uh, Karpov joined Sergei to the Kalmyk case that he reopened, and an arrest team under Kuznetsov came to Sergei's house and arrested Sergei in front of his wife and children. So the entire case uh, was based on Kuznetsov's and Karpov's investigation of a case that they reopened and changed the findings of from crime to no crime, and, and, and a case that they did this when they were themselves under investigation due to our filing. Um, so, and, and if you think that's outrageous, that people who are under investigation can do this to the people who fingered them, right? The trial was even less legitimate than the case because Sergei was dead. Dead men can't defend themselves. Sergei and Bill were defended by lawyers provided by the Russian state. We didn't in any way participate in the trial. It was a show trial where the outcome was never going to be in doubt. So this is how people who paid $407 million in tax in just one year get convicted under a sham case of evading tax. Meanwhile, the criminal group walks off with $230 million of the $407 million of the tax we paid. And Lucy just told you that Sergei wasn't, like, you know, convicted. Well, you know, it says here in July 2013, this is her link, by the way, uh, Tereskoy District Court found him guilty of tax evasion and closed the case due to his death. So we call that a conviction. And you can't sentence Sergei because he's dead. So there's not really much more you can do to him except destroy his reputation. And this is kind of like the Starova story, right? It only works, the lies they tell only works in a vacuum when you don't see the whole picture. It, re it, it relies on hiding documents and facts, in this case, to make it look like these people were in investigating us before we reported them, or that we saved some huge amounts of tax when in fact we paid 24%, and that the trial was legitimate. And when you have all the documents like this, the entire narrative falls apart, which, and I have just an overriding question, why bother? Because if you look at the date, July 2013, Bill's been exiled from Russia since 2005, and Sergei's been dead since 2009, and the criminals have walked away with 230, of the, 230 million of the 407 million we paid. So why do this? And the answer brings us to the next section, which is you do this because they got the money and we can prove it. Um, so, uh, Okay, so the fourth topic is uh, what civil and criminal actions have been filed by anyone, anywhere to freeze or recover assets and what were the results? Right, so I guess you cue uh, three for me. So I'm going to lead you through this and, uh, and a curious fact here. So, you know, the first people we investigated were, of course, the officers who arrested Sergei, and we found out that they had $4.3 million, $4 million worth of assets, cars, apartments that they were living in, all of which were owned by their pensioner parents who were living in old Soviet-style apartments and, and filing, you know, that they, they only get their pensions. So I file a complaint asking for an investigation of the officer's wealth, and the Russians determined rich parents, right? 
Okay, so what about the tax inspectors who signed off on this amazing $230 million refund? We find out they've got $42 million in assets, including 11.7 in Swiss bank accounts. So we file in Switzerland, all the money is frozen, and it's determined to come from the fraud. But in Russia, the Russians conclude that the tax officials were innocent and tricked into making the refund. Apparently, they were tricked into paying it to themselves, right? Um, and money went to all these people we didn't expect. 800,000 goes to Putin's best friend, a cellist, Sergei Rodulgin, and another two billion goes to Rodulgin's company, which makes you wonder if Rodulgin really is, is the guy who owns all that money or not. 1.96 million comes to the son of a Moscow government, uh, regional government official, and 266,000 goes to the wife of a Moscow deputy mayor. I mean, what's going on here, right? So by 2010, it's pretty clear that we're not gonna get any justice in Russia. So Bill launches this uh, effort to try and sanction these people. And by 2011, uh, Senators Cardin and McCain have a bill introduced called the Magnitsky Act, which is to create a legacy for Sergei. It's not just punishment for the people who killed him, but it's a sanctioned re regime named after Sergei, designed to deter and, and punish the people who would commit human rights violations in Russia. So it kind of turns, they treat, we treat them like Al-Qaeda, right? We cancel their visas, we take everything they've got in this country, and we make it illegal to, deal, to do business with them. And as this idea was gaining traction, the Russians went crazy into political lobbying mode to try and kill the sanctions. And it's in the context of this that the Russian police announced that they're gonna try Sergei and Bill. But we get the Magnitsky Act signed into law, Putin bans the adopt Americans adopting Russian children. And now I'm going to return to the cases we filed. So starting in New York, the 1.96 million that went to the son of a Russian official was traced to a company called Prevazone, which was used to buy property in New York. Hermitage files a complaint with the Department of Justice that the stolen money is being laundered through Manhattan real estate. And SDNY brings a civil forfeiture case to seize these properties. And Prevazone retains its lawyer, Natalia Veselnitskaya, whose name, if you don't know, you'll know who I'm talking about in a minute, all right? And so this is when Bill and Sergey are, are convicted. So narrative part one, uh, Sergey and Bill are tax cheats, right? Now meanwhile, the uh, Global Magnitsky Act begins to move through Congress. This is legislation that will expand the Magnitsky sanctions to include corruption. And for some reason, the Russians went nuts when, when corruption became a possible ground for being sanctioned. And the general prosecutor uh, of Russia lets you know that he understands this. If Prevazon is found guilty, the decision will legally validate Va Browder's version of the entire story, and it would support the necessi necessity of passing the sanctions law named after Magnitsky. And this is when Prevazon decides to defend itself with this narrative that they created in the Russian courts, right? They say, we're not just tax cheats. They say that we stole the government money. So these government officials who, who were buying property in New York, they've got to be innocent because we got the money, not them, okay? And as that case pro progressed, the U.S. government asks Russia officially through an MLAT request for information about the money flows inside Russia, and they get an official request back from the Russian government, we don't have to tell you how the money moved inside Russia, because we've investigated this case already, and Bill and Sergei were behind the fraud. Now that sounds pretty bad, right? Um, but the U.S. government didn't buy it. They found that uh, all the, they determined that all the documents that were being supported to uh, support this narrative seem to be forgeries. And this is when the Russian government goes nuts pushing this narrative. So Veselnitskaya sets up an NGO in Washington ostensibly to overturn the ban on adoption. And she walks into Trump Tower. And she, this is the famous Trump Tower meeting, right? And what's her message? We've got some dirt on Hillary Clinton and Bill and Magnitsky are crooks. The U.S. has been tricked. And if your dad becomes president and kills the sanction regime, regime, you can adopt our kids and have good relations with Russia. Let me clarify that deal, right? All you have to do is let murderers and money launderers into the United States and we'll have good relations. That's the deal on the table that she was selling. And just at this point, okay, Veselnitska pays for the screening of a, of a film marketing this uh, alternative narrative. And it's like the, the director pretends to discover all of this himself. Hmm, Starova blew the whistle. Hmm no beating, you know? And then she walks into Congress and she files a report with Congress saying that she has evidence that the grounds for the Magnitsky Act are based on lies perpetrated by Browder. Its claims are identified in the movie and totally identical to what Lucy promotes. Lucy doesn't have to investigate anything. She can read the Veselnitskaya filing play by play. That's her script, okay? So we file with the DOJ alleging that 
Veselnitskaya and her NGO are just a front. And, and this is where things start to go bad, right, for Veselnitskaya. Prevazon's entire U.S. defense team is disqualified. The Global Magnitsky Act becomes law. Veselnitskaya negotiates a $5.9 million settlement without an admission of guilt, which I guess is supposed to save the Russian government narrative for another day. Then the New York Times breaks the Trump Tower meeting, and as you all know, that did not do great things for relations between U.S. and Russia. And remember that response that the Russian government sent to the U.S. government saying that we're the crooks? Well, actually, hacked files come out, and it turns out Veselnitskaya wrote it. I mean, the Russian government was like, hey, boss, what do we do? How do we answer this? And so she secretly tells the Russian government, slap this on your letterhead. It helped me a lot in court. That little trick got Veselnitskaya indicted by SDNY for obstruction of justice. She's in Russia right now, and I hear she doesn't travel very much anymore. Uh, and that should have been the end of the Russian government narrative, okay? But the next day, after Veselnitskaya's indictment, Russia announces they're putting out a red notice arrest warrant on Bill for being part of a trans national criminal group probably responsible for the murder of Sergei Magnitsky. All right, look, en enough of the ridiculous stuff. Let me show you why the narrative and the people who spin it are completely irrelevant, okay? It's a one-minute tour of the avalanche that can't be stopped. So, in 2018, Hermitage identified 21 accounts in Donsky Bank involved in laundering the proceeds of this fraud. You've all heard of the Donsky Bank scandal. We're the guys who blew it. Before any wet whistleblowers came through, CEO has to step down. We filed again against uh, Nordia Bank. We'll see how that goes. We filed against Swedbank. That blew up and the CEO's got to go out. We filed in Austria. We filed in France. We filed in uh, Monaco. We filed in Luxembourg. 10 million frozen. So here's the deal in a nutshell, okay? We filed in 20 plus countries asking to trace money. 17 ongoing uh, criminal investigations all going to figure out what the Russians on the other end. 34 million frozen in five countries. So the veracity of our information and our credibility has been confirmed beyond any doubt by all of these law enforcement agencies. Some of them don't investigate, but the ones who do always find what we allege. allege. Now I want you to contrast that with the Russians, right? The number of cases filed by the Russians to find their stolen money is zero because people who steal money don't go looking for it. That's the deal. And anything Lucy can say won't be able to justify that. Thank you. Um, do you think? Okay, thank you. I have to say, Jamie, you're a brilliant liar. Uh, uh, almost as good as Browder, but some of the points you made, uh, Browder, they didn't use the tax uh, the, the uh, disabled and so on, then why did Browder admit in, uh, at, at Southern District of New York that they did do it? And uh, they, and then you went, you walked back, uh, well, we didn't find out about the tax refund fraud that at that time, well, when was it that you sort of uh, walked that back? These documents where you, you uh, uh, trace the, the name or circle the names of uh, uh, Karpov and Kuznetsov, that's not an accusation. That's a description of that they did this, uh, this search. There is, and if you could, you could find uh, on my website, I have the testimonies, there is no place in that testimony uh, that he gave uh, in, uh, in June and October where he accuses the people. It's a bald-faced lie. Uh, and uh, so I, I can't spend all my time dealing with your lies. Uh, we're, uh, but we're, we're on this, uh, this next part. Now this is really interesting. Uh, Browder says that uh, the Russians went after him on taxes because he was attacking the system, attacking Putin. This is what he was saying about Putin in 2004. He loved Putin. These were myths about Putin on their stationery. Putin's corrupt, nah, can't be. Uh, oligarchs are just like the robber barons. This, this is what uh, Browder put out for the world in 2004 uh, which, when the investigation into the tax evasion in Kalmykia had started the year before. That's what he said about Putin. So uh, we're talking about the, the litigation in the Prevazon case. It was filed by the Justice Department in 2013, Southern District of New York, acting as Browder's proxy. Uh, Prevazon, a real estate company owned by a Russian whose father was a railroad official, therefore Browder could say he was connected to Putin, was accused of receiving 1.9 million of the 230 million tax refund fraud loot. That's under 1%, uh, that's 0.8%, and somehow uh, Browder never picked up anybody, and the, Ru the Americans never picked up anybody else they could target, because you really need somebody with a political uh, moniker. You have to be connected to Putin. 
Uh, to make this case under US law, there had to be a predicate offense, a fraud on a foreign bank. In this case, it was HSBC, a trustee for Hermitage, except Hermitage had not lost any money. The Russian Treasury had lost money. And Prevazan's lawyers got the woman who handled one of Browder's Cypriot shells to recognize her signature, signing off the transfer of Browder's Russian shells to the new owners. So they said the companies were transferred based on powers of attorney given by representative of Hermitage. They were not illegally uh, taken. Prevazan would have to be engaged in transactions involving illicit funds. There was no proof of the illicit origin of Prevazan's funds. The US chief investigator, Todd Hyman, admitted in a deposition the US did not have evidence of the so-called bank tracings the, of the movement of illicit money that Browder gave them. But that didn't matter. The lawyer asking the question was John Moscow and this event. And I love his asking Hyman, did he check the bank records of these banks? No, they were foreign banks. John Moscow, yeah? Does your phone go long distance? N never at issue is uh, what is usually meant in asset recovery, that stolen funds go back to the victims, in this case, the Russian Treasury. It would go to the US, which never claimed to be a loser. This was a political case in which the target was the Russian government. Browder was a useful idiot, and Prevazan a useful target. The case was started by uh, Preet Bharara, then US attorney for the Southern District of New York, who has a reputation as a political operator with ambitions, and an anti-Russian case couldn't hurt. It was political theater. By the way, those bank tracings apparently never led the Justice Department to charge any other recipients of the 99% of the 230 million of the missing tax fraud loop. What is wrong with those tracings, those documents. They had so much evidence. They could target nobody else. The DOJ case never got to trial. Started in 2013, there were many interesting pretrial hearings and depositions. They included a graphic of money transfers that Judge Pauly advised the DOJ not to provide to jurors. It looked like a modern art design, and there was no evidence behind it. The judge rejected the DOJ's attempt to introduce a report by the Parliamentary Assembly of Europe by a Browder acolyte, Andreas Gross. He said, it suffers from lack of trustworthiness. Having read it, doesn't appear to have ever been an actual hearing. It was a fake. The case ended in mid-2017 when Prevazan decided to cut its legal costs and agreed to a $6 million settlement. Uh, when you do that kind of settlement, neither side says, you're guilty, I'm not guilty. It's just a settlement. The agreement said that would come from funds the DOJ had frozen in the Netherlands, but then the DOJ gave Browder advance warning, and he got the Netherlands to freeze those funds seconds after the DOJ unfroze them. Is that what is known as collusion? So the six million was deducted from the amount uh, seized in the US in 2013, since Judge Pauly noted in his ruling that the US government had no control over the Dutch authorities and couldn't make them lift the restraint. Then we get to uh, Boyley Systems. That's the other interesting case, uh, is Browder's attempt in the BVI in Moscow to recover the Hermitage shell companies that had been re-registered in July 07 and were used in collusive lawsuits to affect the tax refund fraud five months later, December 07. The companies were just shells that existed to hold stock buys. They had no assets at that time. They had first been transferred to a shell called Pluton, a Russian company registered in Kazan, owned by the man who went to jail for the fraud, Markelov. Then in February 08, transferred from Pluton to a BVI shell, Boily, uh, uh, company Boily Systems. Remember, the figurehead director was Rima Starova, who lived in Kazan. So Browder and HSBC, the Hermitage trustee, in July 08, five months after Boily got the shells, filed for an injunction against Boily liquidating the companies and in September 08, the BVI court granted the injunction. The court in, in appointed Kroll, the Kroll that you know, the international Kroll, as receiver told it to investigate any fraudulent action by Boyley against the re-registered vehicle and take steps to gain control and recover the companies. Uh, so then the other part of this Boyley problem uh, was an arbitration hearing in Moscow I don't know all the details, except that uh, Browder lost. It's unclear to me why Browder wanted to get back the company since they had no assets. Uh, one possibility is to erase a paper trail, uh, but that is uh, still uh, to, to be looked into. Okay, so 
Uh, you have six minutes each oh, for sorry. closing comments. Lucy, to start. Okay. So. Oh, I'm sorry. This was the. Uh, th this was the great John Moscow. <laughs> this is who's in the back there from the from the deposition. And sorry, I forgot about using these. Okay. This is the, the other important story. It's the Delanian story. A big story. Uh, unreported by the U.S. press is the Delanian story. NBC intelligence and national security reporter Ken Delanian in the NBC News investigative unit in Washington collected information that exposed the browder Magnitsky story as a fake. I know this from the browder Delitsky email exchange. They were, they were hacked, they came from hacked emails of a State Department official named Robert Otto. He's a Russia, Deme Russia Domestic Affairs Division Chief in the Office of Analysis for Russia and Eurasia, and they were uploaded to the internet in 2017. Delanian was going to nail Browder as a big time crook and a con man. And here are uh, the key points uh, in the emails. He says, Magnitsky was a, not a lawyer, but the accountant who handled Browder's taxes for a decade. He uh, pointed out that Browder claimed he hired Magnitsky in 07 to investigate the theft of Hermitage-related companies, but in fact, he had worked for Hermitage and his companies much earlier. Wasn't he working on some of the tax benefits in Kalmykia that led to the imposition of civil judgments for uh, tax evasion? On the theft of the Hermitage companies, which Browder said was done by officials who seized documents in a raid. Delanian pointed out that to re-register a company in Russia at the time, one did not need original seals and documents. He asked, does that undermine the notion that the police stole the seals to re-register the companies? The whistleblower issue. Delanian said Browder said Magnitsky was detained in 08 because he testified police was involved, were involved in a 230 million tax fraud. But the documents on his own website say he was detained in a tax fraud case involving Browder's companies. The whistleblower. Delanian, uh, that's Rima again. Delanian asked for comments on the fact the Russian news media said Rima Starova, a hired name for a shell company that had taken control of the Browder companies, reported the theft of the budget funds to the Russian authorities before Magnitsky allegedly knew about it. Delanian said, how could Magnitsky have been detained in retaliation for an allegation he didn't make until after he was in police custody? That was in October 09, a month before he died. Uh, and it was based on pressure from the Browder people who had been saying they would get him out, but uh, he has to talk about this. And he actually complained about this to Alec Lurie, a journalist who interviewed him in prison, saying, uh, my bosses are trying to get me to talk about something that has nothing to do with the reason I'm here. That was, they wanted him to talk about the tax refund fraud. Uh, he told Browder he would report uh, all allegations uh, Delanian told Browder he would report the allegations that Browder concocted the story of Magnitsky as a whistleblower to cover up his own uh, tax fraud. The forgeries, again. Delanian noted that Browder said Magnitsky accused two police officials of the Interior Ministry. That's the, that's the statement that uh, uh, Jameson made a little while ago. They ended up on the sanction list. Delanian said, according to an NBC News translation, their names do not appear on the Russian version of that document, a forgery. Uh, the death. Delanian said, we have found no evidence that Magnitsky was severely beaten just before his death, as you described. He asked Browder about the report by the Russia Public Oversight Commission, widely cited as a definitive account that made no mention of beatings and said there were no marks on Magnitsky's body other than the handcuff bruises. He asked why would there be no bruises or other marks on his head and torso? So, Cobra and Kim, they were at the London offshore event of, I'm so sorry, I didn't notice that they are here at this one. Cobra and Kim, law firm, Browder's law firm, sent a letter uh, to NBC. Uh, his, uh, Delanian's uh, document, expose, was ready to go in May 2016. Cobra and Kim threatened NBC, which is part of the conglomerate of Comcast, about 50 billion in revenues in 2016, with a lawsuit, and it killed the story. I begin to be a little suspicious about whether or not NBC 
really wanted to kill it anyway. They're known as a very Russophobicization. Why should they be af afraid of, of Browder's and his smaller money? Uh, later, Cobra and Kim would be investigated for having received tens of millions of dollars from the Thai businessman, Joe Lowe, accused of playing a central role in the embezzlement of 4.5 billion from Malaysian uh, fund One Malaysia Development. So I'm not surprised that they may be involved with some dicey characters. If Delaney's story had been broadcast in May 2016, it could have changed the Russiagate events dominating the headlines. It might have upended the fabricated justification for the Magnitsky Act. Ending Magnitsky Act sanctions would have hampered Browder's campaign to promote US-Russia hostilities. There might have been no June Trump Tower meeting the next month, as the Russian lawyer would have had other options. Then, no, maybe no Robert Mueller investigation, since that meeting provoked the appointment of uh, down the road of uh, Council Mueller and his Trump Manafort investigation. Manafort was at that meeting. So why did NBC cave? Uh, well, we know that Robert Otto and his State Department colleagues feared the report's impact. That's in the emails. Uh, William Arkin, a longtime NBC analyst, said he quit recently because the network just ran the State Department line. So it raises the question of why the corporate media now has a lockdown on the Delanian expose, will not report it. You have heard more about it now than anybody else uh, in this country or perhaps elsewhere. Jameson. Do, do I get, oh, I'm sorry, I have to do one, well, there's one more thing. This is, this is short and it's very funny. So this is the Zwerg story, it's, it's funny. This is the PowerPoint that, uh, that Browder put out. And um, uh, Jameson says that one of his lawyers, you've said, I don't know if it was here or, or London, was beaten during the uh, June 07 raid on Firestone Duncan offices conducted by police investigators. Browder's PowerPoint describes this in uh, 09. Here it is. So uh, here's the photo. See the other photo? See at the end, that, that's the guy be, being beaten? See the small photo? Now, look at the next photo. This is the next photo. You know who that photo is? Victor Poryugin, it is not. It's Jim Zwerg, a 1961 U.S. freedom writer who was beaten in Alabama in a protest against bus segregation. The paper on his chest is the Montgomery Advertiser with his bloodied photo on page one. That picture went all around the world. Here it is in the Washington Post. Uh, so couldn't Browder have found a photo of an unknown beaten up guy in a hospital, not an internationally famous one? Sometimes con men and their collaborators are really stupid. Alas, we have found that some of the people in the mainstream media and government are equally stupid or maybe dishonest as they repeat the Browder hoax. Uh, and maybe for Russophobes, he is their useful idiot. This is gonna be fun. Um, look, Lucy, and the Russian government kind of worked the same way. I got oh, no slides for this. On. This is really annoying. Lucy, I, I have, I, Lucy, Lucy, I didn't just, say just you did. I said you let worked the speak. same way. So oh, you, you, it's always but, the way. now let's go through this, right? So, you know, Lucy will be like, Sergei Magnitsky wasn't a lawyer because he didn't go to law school. Lucy forgets to tell you that law is not a licensed profession in Russia, that you don't have to go to law school to be a lawyer in Russia, just like you don't have to go to law school to be a lawyer in the state of California, okay? Lucy uh, is the only person in the world who sees a PowerPoint presentation where we use a picture to, inst to illustrate somebody being beaten and thinks it's the actual picture. Lucy doesn't read very carefully because if you read Mr. Browder's book, that threatening phone call with the person being beaten is clearly three days before, and we were reported it to Scotland Yard when it happened. But I, excuse me, but I actually don't want to get down, you can ask me in Q&A uh, anything you want me to explain, but um, part of what they do is they go, well, what about this and what about that? And they have 32 million narratives and they want to like distract you from doing your job. And let me tell you what my job is. Um, it's not paying too much attention to these people and concentrating on the only two things that matter. The only two things that matter are tracing that money and seeing whose pockets it went to and having Magnitsky sanctions in place all around the world so that when we find who it went to, we can sanction them. And what I came here to tell you today is, is a, a story about uh, seeing the, the forest instead of the trees, okay? Because I was Sergey's boss and I worked for, Ser Sergey worked with me for 10 years and he sat in my office and I know his wife and I watched his kids grow up and I was supposed to, you know, keep him out of trouble, which obviously I didn't do. And uh, Hermitage Capital also worked with Sergey for 10 years and they really liked him. Um, and I can tell you that if we knew what we were gonna find 
Um, I would have pulled Sergey from the case. And Bill Browder, by the way, would have pulled Sergey from the case and said, hey, look, you know, hang anything you want on us. Nobody's going to die over this. But you don't get uh, a replay in these situations. And when we found out that Sergey died, um, for those of us who couldn't go back to Russia, Bill arranged a memorial service. And I spoke at that service in, in London. And what I said was that I want Sergei's children to understand that although the Russian government has named him a criminal, that he wasn't a criminal, that he did something heroic, and, and, and that he would be a national hero exposing this tax fraud anywhere else, and that we would try our best, uh, we would not let it stand. And, you know, secretly, I didn't know if we could do that, right? I thought that maybe there were going to be like three or four newspaper articles about Sergei, and then that would be it. Nobody would hear his name again. And if you Googled him, you'd get the Russian narrative. But look what we've done 10 years later, right? We traced all the money to the people he testified against. We traced all the money to these other officials. We, we, we blew the, li the lid on Donsky Bank and all this. We've got money laundering investigations going on in all these countries. And we've got the Magnitsky sanctions going. And the Magnitsky sanctions, by the way, are going viral. We've got them in the United States, we've got them in Canada, we've got them in the UK, we've got them in the three Baltic countries, and they're moving through the EU Parliament. And when we get them there, we're going to have upwards of 30 countries that have Magnitsky sanctions. And there's a whole lot, a, a bunch of other countries that are going to take those sanctions the second the EU passes them. And, and so my job, right, is to make sure that that happens, not to pay too much attention to this, because this narrative has a purpose. This narrative was developed to try and undermine sanctions. This narrative is supposed to destroy sanctions. This narrative is supposed to brand uh, Bill Browder a crook so they can red notice him and send him to Russia and put him in a cell like they did to Sergei and possibly kill him. But I got bad news for the Russians because this can't be stopped anymore. There are 17 criminal investigations in different nations going after the money. And the Magnitsky sanctions can't be stopped because on the anniversary of Sergei's death, I got a ping on my mobile phone and I looked at it and it was a story. And what the story said was that the United States of America sanctioned 17 Saudis for their role in killing a, a journalist and cutting his body up in an embassy in, in, in Turkey. And I thought, you know, my God, we've really done it. This thing has legs. It's moving without us. And what a wonderful legacy to leave for Sergei. And so when I get up in the morning, right? Let me tell you what I think about. Because we thought we were just fighting a bunch of crooks, right, who stole some money. But it's actually bigger than that, right? We're actually fighting a country that's trying to make the world safe for their blood money, right? It's the same country that sent somebody over to England and poisoned my, my, my friend Marina's husband with radioactive pl pl uh, polonium, and the same country that poisoned the scripples in England, the same country that hacked our elections, the same country that hacks our social media so that we can't talk to each other anymore and compromise with our neighbors so our, our governments don't work anymore. Anymore. That's what I get to fight every morning. That's continuing uh, Sergei's fight. So, you know, I'm going to just tie this back to the name of this, uh, th this panel, hero or villain, right? Well, that really is a matter of perspective. It depends on whose side of this war you're standing on, okay? But I tell you that for, for those of us who are involved in this effort, this is the thing that we are proudest of. Look at what we've managed to do. A and we've done this uh, and created a legacy for Sergei, and we really, really feel good about it, and I'll be very happy to answer all your questions. Thank you. Uh, you actually said something very interesting. Uh, you said that uh, Sergei Magnitsky had worked for you, for, uh, had worked for Her Hermitage uh, for 10 years. Browder tells everybody that as soon as the uh, search of the offices uh, went on in June 07, he went out and found the best lawyer he could find, Sergei Magnitsky. Obviously, somebody is lying. Either he's working for, uh, for Browder for 10 years, or he's gone out to find him. So it's interesting that you said that. I'm pleased that uh, you've corrected one uh, error that's been made. Do we have any questions? Yeah, just out of curiosity, um, who believes Bill Browder's version on the balance of probabilities? Could I have a show of hands? And who doesn't believe his version? A few more believe him than, than don't. To explain my kind of waving of a hand, um, with the narrative, 
it seems a lot of Lucy's uh, counter argument is that Bill Browder was to a degree a crook, which no offense to the hedge fund people here and to people working in Russia, but if you're a major hedge fund runner in Russia, I mean, it's highly likely there is some shadiness um, to a degree. Uh, my question is for Lucy is, when did you start working on this matter and what really inspired you to start writing about this? interested in the uh, offshore system for about 20 years, and I have various sources around. And uh, one source I have, not in the US, uh, gave me some documents about Khodorkovsky. And it showed how the operation in London, uh, it was called the Jurby Lake system. The FT wrote about it a little bit, but not in detail. But it showed how he used transfer pricing uh, for Yukos through the Isle of Man uh, to cheat the minority shareholders. He and his friends had 60%, there were 40% others, and the, and the tax authorities in Russia, people of Russia, uh, because they would sell something through the Isle of Man company for X amount, and then they would sell it on the market for 10 times X amount, or whatever the number was. And uh, there was, uh, it, it looked like people were uh, getting, uh, law enforcement was looking into this, and the guy who was the head of the operation uh, in uh, Russia seemed, the story in the FT was he may have been going to give evidence, and he was in a helicopter and it crashed. That was very suspicious. But I got the, all the documents, the Khodorkovsky documents. And, I want, and then uh, from there, uh, I also got uh, documents uh, information about Avisma, that Khodorkovsky, this was a titanium company, is a titanium company in Russia, and uh, Avisma uh, was owned by Khodorkovsky and his group, and they wanted to sell it because they wanted to put all their assets toward oil. So they sold it to Kenneth Dart of Dart Cups, billionaire Dart Cups, and Bill Browder, a minority investor, and a guy named Francis Baker, also a minority investor uh, from New York. And uh, the thing about that was, the deal was they wanted to keep the transfer pricing. It's actually in uh, documents, and I'll tell you how I got the documents. But uh, the transfer pricing was cheating. So uh, the problem is the transfer pricing was run by a guy, some of you may know this famous, infamous guy. His name is Peter Bond on the Isle of Man. And he was running the, uh, the company. But there is no honor among thieves. So the, the argument was Peter Bond did not give the new owners the rake off. And he said, well, the ownership really shifted in December. And the Dart, Browder, Baker people said, no, we got the ownership in October. And uh, they went back and forth on this. And um, Browder is interesting. He transcribes things, like even his own phone conversations. Uh, and the reason I'll tell you in a minute why I know what he said, because one of the things he said was to Peter Bond, I think we can manage this. We can work something out. We're talking about crookedness, thieving, stealing. Well. Uh, then they did work something out, and uh, Peter Bond paid $8 million to the group. But then Avisma was bought by VSMPO, which is a Russian company that uses titanium in its production. And so then uh, its lawyer, a guy named Bruce Marx, who has offices in Moscow and Philadelphia, uh, went to the Russian, uh, this company's offices, the legal offices, which were in London, Avisma's offices in London, and started going through the, the books there. Uh, and he said to me later, Lucy, I cannot believe it. They let me into the files, and there in the files were all the documents from this lawsuit in which it was admitted that the people that owned Avisma now, Dart and Browder and Baker, cheated my client because the money should have come into their treasury. And so then uh, uh, they went to uh, a RICO case. Uh, Bruce Marx filed a RICO case, and there was a settlement, and that's confidential, but I'm assuming that the Dart, Browder, Baker people had to pay off uh, uh, VSMPO. Then, uh, so I went to uh, Bruce Marx, after the case was closed, I went to Bruce Marx's office and spent an entire day scanning boxes of, uh, of, of the court uh, documents, including one guy saying, well, it's, it was not interesting to us to buy this company unless we were gonna get the rake off. And Browder is saying the same thing. And all of them are saying, you know, we, we want to get this, the rake off. And the people that are doing, there's a company, a group called Credit Anstalt, that was an arranger uh, of this sale. And they're saying, don't worry, you're going to get the rake off. So all of that is in there. Uh, I wrote about it for um, 100 reporters. Browder, of course, uh, would not uh, 
would not talk to me. Interesting, talking about the media. And this guy is actually mentioned in the Browder deposition. Um, there's a guy named Bill Alpert, who's an editor at Barron's, and he's mentioned in Browder's deposition as one of the people, together with the Organized Crime and uh, Corruption Project, uh, which is in Eastern Europe, uh, worked with him on putting together the documents they would give the Justice Department. So I had uh, done a piece for uh, uh, Bill Alpert before about another corruption case involving uh, a phone company and, and that bribed uh, Aristide in Haiti. Uh, and uh, n this, so this has nothing to do with it, but they ran that story. I thought maybe they like this story. I did not know that, uh, that he was a Browder acolyte. Alpert was a Browder acolyte. He just wanted to know how much I know. He wanted to get the documents. He actually gave me the money. The, he paid the expenses for me to go to Philadelphia on the train. I had to pay to get the uh, cartons out of storage. And I provided all the, the key documents to him. And I said, this is a great story. It's absolutely foolproof. I have all the evidence. Browder, of course, would not talk to me. So I wrote up the story. And then uh, Bill Alpert says, well, Browder gave me a call. He said, it's really not true. It's not true. Can't you read the documents? He says it's all true. Then I found out that, uh, you know, Alpert's pretty much a, you know, I don't consider him a journalist. He's uh, an acolyte and he works for Browder. And then I found out some of his, uh, he writes puff pieces about Browder. That's how I got into this. I knew the guy was a crook because I had done that story, had all the evidence. And the same, um, uh, 100 Reporters was interested in me, in me uh, doing this story. So that's a long introduction, but it shows you that, first of all, I work only on documents. I don't write, write up fake pictures and say, this means this. I'm just showing a picture, but this is what it really means. I show uh, real documents. It's all on my website. If you look at this story, it will link, it will link, it will link to all the documents. That's the answer. Does anyone else have any questions? Does, uh, does anyone have any questions? Well, yeah, I, I do have a question. Um, Bill Browder says that I think when he first went to Moscow, he didn't speak Russian. He just basically flew there and um, got the telephone directory out and started dialing names, and he arranged 30 meetings approximately in one day. Now, that on its face seems to be ridiculous to me and sort of goes to his sort of credibility. So Lucy referred to pictures of the torso of Magnitsky without bruises on them. How many times has Bratter testified that he was beaten for any period of time? I mean, I heard him testifying before the Canadian Parliament, where he's well received, that the man was beaten for an hour and 18 minutes. I thought that he'd gotten that confused with the delay in getting the ambulance there. But how many times has he said that Magnitsky was beaten to death? And don't, don't forget, don't lose track of the memory, how many times has he said it and you and he have known it was false? Um, actually, and if you read Bill's book, um, what Bill says is that um, Sergei was beat, handcuffed and beaten and that ambulance workers waited one hour and 18 minutes outside. You can read his book. Well, 
Well, he was actually beaten. I think that's pretty clear. You see, John, I think that... Uh, you, wait, no, no, I'm not. I'm not. You're not letting me speak. So here's the deal, right? Picture any of you guys. Your appendix is about to burst or your pancreas. I don't really care which one. You need an emergency operation right now or you're going to be dead in the morning, okay? And so what I do is I call eight guys who handcuff you and beat you with rubber truncheons. Now, listen, I can't tell you how many of the eight people beat him, okay? And I can't tell you how long they beat him for. But what I can tell you, uh, you know, and, uh, is that... If you need emergency surgery now and I handcuff you and I have you beaten and I leave you one hour and 18 minutes and then the emergency people open the door and you're dead, that, I, I think that's beaten to death. But that's I think a that lie and there the is no evidence and the only uh, documents that show any uh, contusions or bruises are on his wrists and ankles and you know that there was in evidence in discovery the picture of of uh, Magnitsky, and there are no marks on his torso. And that is why his mother told uh, Nekrasov, uh, Nekrasov in the film that she does not believe that Magnitsky was beaten. There were, there is, you have no evidence actually, he was beaten. It's a fabrication. Actually, Lucy, do you speak Russian? Yet. Okay, you, you know, you're the wrong person to be investigating this case then, because you can't true. actually read the documents. I read but, the documents. But let me tell you what the movie, let me tell you what the movie says. And I actually sent David a clip. What Magnitsky's mother says, and this was what was so disgusting about that movie, is she said, I find it, it, the wording is the same, I find it difficult to accept, to come to terms with that Sergei was beaten, which he translated horribly as Magnitsky says she doesn't believe he was beaten. Any Russian speaker can watch that and see that game, okay? Tell so, the he was just the documents from the police files? Why don't you show the picture that was introduced and is in discovery in the Prevazon case, shows the body, the torso, with no bruises? Why don't you do that? Why don't you put up th that on your PowerPoint? Listen, let me ask you a question, right? If I handcuff you and I beat you on the knuckles while your appendix is bursting, right? His appendix what was not Listen, bursting. I don't care. And he wasn't beaten on the knuckles. He was banging on the door. And if you read the Public Oversight Commission report, they describe that behavior. You have just made the whole thing up. Uh, no, if I could just make a comment, um, this is Elise Bean. I have followed this from afar. I had no particular position on this because I wanted to see this debate. But I have to tell you, I think it's absurd that this is what you're arguing about. The guy died in prison. Who cares if it was beaten on his knuckles or not beaten on his knuckles? Who cares? The fact was, he's dead. He's dead in prison. This happens in the U.S. And I find it US. very weird that you are having this huge argument about whether he was beaten or not. Who cares? He's it's a big dead. difference. It's a big difference because if you... It goes to credibility of Bill Browder, I think, is where it's relevant. It's a big difference because, you know, I think the Justice Department has just taken over Alabama prisons because it's so terrible. You, if I get the Justice Department uh, reports, uh, I also read the Marshall. Uh, there, there is a... Uh, uh, a, a website uh, which is about justice in the U.S. run by a former Times editor. The, the people being treated in the U.S. prisons, it's terrible all the time. Lack of medication, lack of medical care, it's terrible. It's not the same thing as being beaten, though that does happen well, we too. Actually need the to. whole point of the Magnitsky Act, it says in there, Magnitsky was a whistleblower and he was beaten to death. It's a lie. Right. That, that, uh, that Magnitsky Act okay. cannot stand okay. on a lie. That's why it is important. Yeah, I'd like to just to perhaps to articulate, I think, what the message we were just hearing behind me was, the, the, it is a horrifying problem. In your own presentation, ma'am, you accepted, it sounded to me when I saw your slides, that minimally he died by virtue of uh, medical, health care, delivery, neglect. And that is under circumstances where the prisoner is known to be ill, seriously ill, at risk of death, that that could be arguably criminal negligence causing death, which is a form of homicide. So I support the view that whether he was punched in the head or in the torso with a club or allowed to die through criminal negligence causing death through the deprivation of access to health care, it matters not a farthing. 
Now, what? perhaps Bill Browder, who wasn't present and wasn't an eyewitness, has an understanding that there was beating and has uh, conflated that or exaggerated that. And maybe that's harmed his credibility. That's a separate issue from whether a wrong was done to this man. It was terrible. It happens in US prisons all the time. And nobody says that those people should be going to jail all the time. And there's a big difference in the Magnitsky Act saying the guy died for lack the lack of medical care is not what the Magnitsky Act says. It says he was a whistleblower. That's a fabrication. It says he was beaten to death. That's a fabrication. Then change the law. Uh, then put in, and forget about the whistleblower because he wasn't, but say he died because he didn't get good medical, decent, proper medical care, and therefore we should have sanctions against the Russians. And that's an interesting point to make, because then other, the Russians may say, well, what about Alabama? What about North Carolina? Maybe we should, should sanction those people, because they're people that have died there because they didn't get good medical care in prison. It's a whole other ballgame. Okay, we need to wrap it up, because they need to combine the rooms. So thank you very much. <laughs>